properties, headers, things like that. Basically, all the stuff that the original burp object had, you, had, you now have in the replayed ones. Um, so right here, I'm just going to do a diff of all my replayed requests uh, and, and res responses. Just output it to a file. So the first one, basically, uh, you, can't, you can't really see that, but basically it was just showing a script alert tag again in the uh, response. Um, down below, here I have on the right side, there's a set cookie header being uh, set in the res response headers, and it's also redirecting to some main uh, bank page. So, and then the fudge string that was sent was like or one equals one, basically the uh, same fudge strings that Nathan uh, replayed earlier uh, with Selenium. Uh, one of the cool things, um, basically just save state, basically I just pickle my uh, my burp blog to a state file. Um, all the replayed requests, responses, all that data is basically available to me uh, if I choose to reload it later on. So uh, I find that really useful uh, so I don't have to do everything between 9 and 5. Um, I could actually do it tomorrow. Um, so basically you got all the same stuff that you originally had when you replayed these requests. So. I know you couldn't see that, but uh, Damn, it's actually pretty cool. <laughs> that's, that's also available in the zip file, so the API is available in the zip file and all the other tools that we were talking about. We, we should post a link to the video, so if you want to watch the video. Yeah, we'll, we'll upload the videos to YouTube so you can actually, when you're thinking about it later, maybe you'll so, watch it. So, like I said, um, you know, a couple cool things is save state, load state. Um, parsing, it takes about like a minute per 100 megabyte file, uh, which is, I think, relatively fast, but if you guys find a way to make it faster, that's cool. I'd love to be faster, because I'm all about performance, not security. <laughs> um, spoken like a true developer. Uh, other times it's nice to have browser objects to play with. So d who in here knows that you can write uh, Firefox extensions in Python? Awesome. Nobody. Well, take my word for it and don't verify it. That's what we need to do. So you can write Firefox extensions in, in, uh, in Python. Uh, there's actually in, an extension called PyCom, uh, PYXPCOM ext, uh, and you use that and it loads up an entire Python. Uh, environment. And, and I did this for a while, but my frustration really had me going when you can't really interface with the browser object too well using Python, like you have to keep resorting to, uh, you have to keep resorting to JavaScript. Um, and JavaScript is kind of for sadists too, so I mean I don't like a language that just chokes and dies and never gives me any indication that it worked or didn't work. I mean who thought that one up? But so I like to stay away from JavaScript. Um, so recently I started switching to do more things in WebKit uh, using some of the other GUI frameworks. So say for instance you're doing a standalone Zool Runner object and since we want, we're all about context when we're testing, we want to be able to make a request with like HTTP lib2, modify our headers, do all this, get the response back and then render it in the browser object. Well doing that in Zool Runner or, or Firefox is a pain. It's a nightmare. One thing that I, I noticed when I first started doing WebKit stuff is you could just say, you could call the object and say set HTML. So here's an example of using PyQt and just a couple of lines of code and doing a test for cross-site scripting. Because cross-site scripting is one of those things that's nice to see a rendered response. Sometimes it's just easier to see that. So we have our URL, we have our request, and then we do the, the web object, set HTML, and then tell it to show. And on the next page, on the next page, <laughs> you can see that once it renders, you can see, it's very easy to see that that was vulnerable to cross-site scripting. Obviously, cross-site scripting is very browser dependent, so sometimes you'll have one in one engine and one in the other, but for, for very simple, you know, universal cross-site scripting uh, vulnerabilities, this could be very, very useful. Um, also, you can do other cool things like instantiate an inspector on some content, so you'd be able to open it up and, and have syntax highlighted uh, examples. And Web, WebKit also, like Py and PyQt, 
uh, is starting to support more, uh, have more support for plugins, which makes it nice when you're when you're dealing with like Silverlight. So that's all we had time for on that one. <laughs> but very simple, couple lines of code, and you've basically rendered a response that you got from a, from a different module. I think there were like hitting them with a bait and switch with a couple lines of code because everyone knows like a couple lines of code equals like several man hours and well you already pointed out that you said <laughs> here's a single line of code but it's actually three on the page so you kind of gave it away right there and we can't count <laughs> which, is re which is really bad when you're implementing ranges uh, web services are also something else that uh, uh, that scanners have a real problem with regardless of you know what vendor documentation says um, you know, because it's really hard to tell if you're if you're enumerating through a WSDL and you see different things that say admin. Obviously, you know you might want to take a better look at that. Um, with with Python, they have uh, the so. Has anybody ever used SUDS before? A couple people. Three people. <laughs> the the best thing about SUDS is it's, it's, is is it has an object API. So everything is is you know you create the object and you call its methods. It's very nice. It's very very Pythonic. Um, it uses URLib2 for opener support. So URLib2 is an extensible library, which means that you can create you know, new protocols and handlers and, and install those. So as long as it's using URLib2, that means if you're handling basic auth, if you need to handle cookies, if you need to do all of that, um, it has support for it and it's familiar support because it's URLib2. Um, so to, to just read a WSDL in a couple lines of code, um, actually this is two, so it really is a couple. Um, you just basically point it to a URL and then print print the client, and that prints off the the WSDL's methods. I guess it, we already have like two findings on this one page. Like we got published WSDL and uh, basic auth in use. Like. Yes. So yeah, there's two findings already by the time you, by the time you get here. <laughs> so the it, basic auth is supported uh, by merely adding a username and password, um, and then to perform functions based on the WSDL, uh, you just basically call the method. So so here, here's a, an example of doing a currency conversion. So from right here, um, you basically point it to the WSDL, you create the client, uh, and you get your result, and you print your result. So here's a, a real example of, of identifying SQL injection in a web service. Uh, and this is uh, going against WebGoat's web service. Um, so we're creating our own headers, and as you can see here, um, the J session ID is already set and the auth basic auth is already set, so we didn't need to use the username and password. Um, we create a custom transport to add, our, add to our headers, so it's a little more complicated than it really needed to be just to kind of show you how it works. Uh, you create your client and then you iterate over the top of your SQL injection value. So here I, I basically took PyWebFuzz and I imported the FuzzDB and then I asked for all of the the generic SQL injection values and iterate it over the top of them. So once you do that, there's some win because you can see the certain values that were printed off. Uh, the other values, when it comes back successful, those are credit card numbers. So, you know, pretty easy. Just a couple lines of code. Just a couple lines of code. You guys are you know, all going to go back to work. And you guys like, are oh, going to go back to work saying, lines. oh my God, you know, finding all these vulns with this is easy. So um, I do a lot of Flex stuff. Um, Flex basically is a uh, framework for developers to write web applications on Flash. Um, one of the features of Flex is you can uh, encode uh, uh, messages in AMF action message format. Basically it's just a compact uh, binary stream. Um, several tools support AMF. There's like Burp, Charles, Web Scarab. Um, unfortunately, like the, the support for AMF is kind of limited. Um, you can't really craft messages from scratch with burp or, or like add properties to a request. Um, and I, I just find like, uh, say hi to pi AMF. Basically, <laughs> I can work now with AMF in, in Python. Um, basically, there's several AMF encoders and decoders. Um, so you can uh, serialize Python types to AMF. So if you have like a daytime object, it gets serialized to, to uh, action script daytime. Um, and then when it gets deserialized by like uh, Blaze DS, which is the remoting server, um, that gets deserialized into a Java util.date object. So how um, many people in here have, have like assessed a Flex app or dealt with something with a Flash front end? So good, a few people. Yeah, good luck with a web scanner on those. Um, so basically with, with PyAMF, we can write our clients um, to, to, to test stuff. Um, 
there's there's some remoting gateway support. So like uh, for the Django or Twisted, if you have a web app, uh, you can write a web app in Python that serves up content in AMF, and a, and a Flash client will be able to work with it. Um, so I don't know how many people have heard of DBlaze. Uh, shout out to my buddy John Rose. Last year, he wrote this tool in Python, basically enumerated uh, methods and services on a remoting server. Um, but he did it like by brute force, one HTTP request at a time. Um, the cool thing about AMF, um, all AMF requests are packaged inside an AMF an AMF envelope. So like, I thought, like, shit, why not do this all at once? Um, my my HTTP request is like 200 uh, bytes long, but uh, 200,000 bytes long. But I just enumerated like 10,000 methods and services all on this one server and one HTTP request, which was just awesome because it only took like a minute to, to respond. So that's one of the cool things you could do. Um, when uh, testing flex apps, uh, you're probably going to run into um, cases where when you're sending a, a value, um, it's, it's not the correct type. So you might have some custom object, like an employee object in the flash client that's being sent over the wire to uh, the remoting server. And just passing a string or a boolean as that is not going to work. So when this happens, um, your proxy is not going to understand the structure of that object. Um, it's going to choke when it's going to try to deserialize it. So again, with just a couple lines of code, we can now create an object factory, basically a dictionary, um, and uh, register that class with an alias uh, namespace or class alias. So that when PyAMF goes to actually encode that Python object to the AMF stream, it encodes it as, say, that employee object. And then when the server gets it, it deserializes it back to uh, whatever object you're playing with. Um, so it's pretty neat. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it's early. Uh, .NET integration. Um, how many people here have ever used Iron Python at all? So a few. Very good. So you, you might not be aware that you can use your Python code inside of .NET. And that provides some very useful advantages. For example, like being able to import .NET DLLs and call functions on them. Uh, you, you know, so it might be a Silverlight object or, or some, some other uh, .NET environment. Um, you, you also have integration uh, into the .NET common language runtime, so you can import the CLR. So on the next page, you could do something like download the zap file, unzip it, grab the manifest, enumerate through it, and grab all the DLLs. So in the bottom is a simple example of importing the common language runtime, adding a reference, and importing all the functions out of the DLL. Um, so pretty simple. Um, yeah, I know, whatever. Um, so basically, you know, when, as you're assessing web apps, you're going to come across cases where, you know, your app is actually speaking a binary protocol. Um, I know it's, it's, not un, it's not heard of before, but basically your scanner is going to choke when it's going to try hitting its binary protocol. You're probably going to choke, like spit your coffee, be like, damn it, why do I <laughs> get stuck with this app? Now I got to like spend time reversing this thing, but whatever. Um, Python has a module called struct, uh, has a module in the standard library called struct. Basically, we could, um, convert Python uh, values into uh, native C structures. Um, let's take an example, binary protocol. Basically this is kind of similar to what most uh, binary protocols are. Um, basically we have like type markers before the types. Um, strings are encoded in UTF-8 preceded by the, after the type marker for a string. We have the length of the string um, encoded as like a short, a 16 byte integer. Um, in web apps, I don't, I don't, nobody knows what a short is, but <laughs> um, so then, then, then the value, your string. So parsing a string, basically, you know, as we run into that type marker of say 0x02, um, we unpack uh, the following value into a, into a short, which is the H format specifier, um, advance our position by two bytes, um, and then unpacked that string uh, for the necessary length. Um, writing a string is basically the opposite. Um, write our type marker, um, write the length of our string as a, as a short, and write the string. Um, so when you put it all together, basically, as we're iterating over every uh, position in the, uh, in the stream, 
you know, as you run into these markers, basically you do the appropriate parsing um, of that data. Um,